Paul Roy and there's something that something they said about me is I'm safe in an airplane, I'm safe in the boat, but I'm dangerous in the microphone. So uh we're gonna have some fun here. Anyways, uh I wrote a book about uh, my dad's airplane collection called You Can Find the Backyard. Uh, I have some copies available here. I signed up for all this corner, but did not make that, so that's fine. I have a few just to uh, y'all reach just later. I have a little fun here. Uh, that's the publisher picked that cover. This is the cover I wanted. Jim Clampett and his son co old airplanes home by Jethro. That's me and dad by a TV interview slides behind a Clover 57 Chevy Suburban about 1970. And for some reason, the publisher rejected this book cover. And, and uh, having more fun with the book, it's read at EAA. I put a little sticker in there like you see in experimental aircraft. I just changed it a little bit. FAA passenger warning. This book was amateur written and does not comply with federal safety regulations for standard books. So I'm saying a little fun with myself there. So. Uh, here we are, Mary Venture. Uh, this is my dad, Walter Ace of Water. Right, about to, in his, uh, he's in his late 20s with an American Eagle. It was the first airplane he owned. He paid 100 bucks for it, sold about 500. Uh, it wasn't airworthy when he really flew it, but it was shortly after he uh, sold it, and it was the only American Eagle flying in the 1960s. It was featured in many magazines. Uh, I first went to Oshkosh in 1974, I went to 74, 5, and 6, and kind of break, but early on, I was at Peter in the Woods, and I think it was the great Paul Harvey was uh, up there on stage, and he kind of launched the crowd that he talked about fabric and, and steel and aluminum and electrics and all those things. This, he reminded folks that every airplane out here is a story about people. It really comes down to that. The airplanes are great, these are all stories about people. And some people are very extraordinary people, that's what I thought we were about to find out. A little less extraordinary guy is this little guy by the course that he me about age uh, about age six or so. And he's getting weeds are tall. I'm not yet picking up God the lawnmower, but it'll get better. And I got this pipe dream uh, later on that I would someday fly a chance for the Air Force, but that was a, a major pipe dream. I don't know if that'll ever happen. Uh, my father was a hardcore blue collar man. Uh, I had been past the eighth grade. And college was kind of almost a dirty word in the family. It was college and sort of military type of college education. That, that's going to come up as an issue later on. Uh, who he was, that was a uneducated scrap man, a carpenter with very limited resources, and yet he collected some of the rarest of the rare aircraft. This is not just a Corsair, it's what people refer to as a Super Corsair, a Jeff 2 g it's got a giant engine on it, and only had a small handful of these aircraft. They're designed to be kamikaze hunters, airplanes that could really climb fast and intercept the kamikazes before they got too close to our ships. But they were in flight test when we dropped the A-bomb in World War II ended, so they never saw service, but they were really, really good race planes with that big engine. So it's a rare, rare airplane, it's rare when it was new, and even rarer later on. Uh, there's assumptions about my father. I often had to explain some things that he was not and where we were not. People would assume a guy like that was certainly a pilot, maybe an airline, or military, maybe a mechanic for a major airline, uh, and then that we might be what airport you guys at. Well, uh, he was not a professional pilot. He sold this Piper Cup photo here. That's me standing by as I got checked out on it. It's the same tail number my father solo in the late 40s. Uh, he got about 22 hours to line Piper Cubs and that was the end of his flying career. Uh, he had a family after that. It cost money. Uh, he, was not a, he got his power plant license in 1955 but he never practiced uh, being a mechanic. And we, we were not in an aircraft. Uh, at an airport, we, all this happened in our backyard. It's a little wordy of a slide. Uh, I know about speaking to the Air Force. They said talk to your audience, not to the slide. I'm not cheap. I'm not Air Force anymore, so this is almost a little bit for me. But I thought a flight plan is going to outline for you to know Walter. I'm going to call him Walter to his dad. I want you to know my father, BFR directed, if you will. Not through me, but through the presentation. So I'm going to refer to Walter a lot rather than dad. Uh, I'm going to the wrong guy to do this. Uh, and the, I could want to talk about the planes because if I'm in an airplane down for you, we'll look at two of his rarest aircraft, 
and uh, explain the case. How uh, that is, the Monument Warfare Committee is okay, a few rare good aircraft. And then two examples of the extremes he would go through to haul a plane home. There's a lot more than two, must be limited to two. Uh, we rarely had a crane or a lift at any location to disassemble an aircraft and on the trailer. Now, as I like to say, we had to make sure that gravity was a friend and never let it become our enemy. The fork in the road, as he got more and more planes, and as I was growing up, folks would ask, what's he going to do with all this someday? And as his son, I had the same question. Did he have a plan for the future? Would I be part of that plan, maybe? Uh, and, and I wanted to be a pilot, he's strangely enough, conflicted with where he was going. Uh, a little bit wordy here. I've got not too many of these. It's an improbable story that never should have happened. Walter suffered many hardships as a young boy. He was uh, raised very poorly in the Depression, as was everyone else in his generation. Uh, he was abandoned and uh, abused by an alcoholic father. Uh, at age eight, he lost his father to alcohol and uh, other issues. His house fire later destroyed the house, burned right to the ground. He had built a lot of balsa wood airplanes. Like about a dozen or so, but all perished in the crash of the the fire. He stuttered and was not educated beyond the eighth grade. So, you know, this, on paper, this guy's going nowhere, but uh, we'll see. He's, uh, when, when his balsa wood planes burned, he just went to real airplanes instead of uh, model airplanes. And left him with some personal issues paranoia and some distrust of others. Uh, I'm a little joke out. He could cuss like a neighbor. This is a Navy friendly presentation. Cuss like a sailor. Uh, he lived much of his life with just a few hundred dollars available. He drove lousy vehicles and had a terrible, severe shortage of equipment to dismantle aircraft. Now, I want to point out I don't say all this to put my father down, but instead, it, it's kind of, to me, it elevates the celebration of what he achieved of it, overcoming so many obstacles to do what he did. So, how did it happen? Well, the first clue, well, which is why we're all here, he loved airplanes. Oh gosh, he loved airplanes. His circumstances thought that he self-reliant, made a lot of his own equipment, and the thing so far out of the box is my view there's no box that could contain my father. And you may think that's over the top. So I've got some slides coming that will back me up to the way I've never no box that could contain this guy. Very self-reliant. He goes to the shop and our home largely was salvaged a warmer engine crate lumber. There was a scrap yard where they were melted down uh, the crated engines from warbirds by the thousands. Brand, you guys are gonna, this is hard to say, brand new, brand new, 2800, you know, I'm, 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 brand new, and they're cellophane wrappers getting melted up and going to the furnace. Uh, there is so much wood that uh, one guy spent all day burning it, so he has to fall safe, and I just trailer some home, and he trailer lots of that wood home, and, and uh, you'll see something that slides ahead. Use it excessively by our own and shop. And I have a joke about myself. Uh, while those boards were around when I was a kid, and they still had their stencils but with the nomenclature about the engine. So my first spelling words probably weren't talking cat, they were probably Brad Whitney. <laughs> Both and outside the box, he used a junk $100 school bus called a Bought F7 New Cutlass Home, all 600 miles of Boston. I got photos of that. And then our family 57 Chevy Suburban, a straight six engine ship to three in the column, would hold not one but two B-25s, A-26, and I thought one of the other big aircraft. So that's just one thing to be possible. Here's <laughs> first of his rare aircraft. This is again a better picture of Corsair 74. It had won the Cleveland National Air Race since 1947, mostly thanks to that giant R-2360 engine. That was race pilot, Cook Cleveland. Uh, there's an SPD Dauntless here. Copeland was a war hero flying the SPD in World War II. He actually got five kills air to air flying the Dauntless, if you imagine that. And he was given half credit for sinking a Japanese ship. He was also a credit of Admiral Halsey, but that's another story about how he got all these four shares. He got more than one. This again a shot of 74 at the air races, signed by Cook Cleveland. This is in our backyard now. This this people visiting our backyard. Of course, there's 74 the column there by them. A BT-15 behind that, not a 13, a BT-15, I assure you. A T-55 cat behind that. So the first airplane I called with my father, by the way. 
Here it is, just know that's me by the prop link at age 12 in 1965. And you go to the house now, you can see how big that fellow is. Oh my gosh. There's a shadow of dad in the lower left corner. Uh, at, uh, that's just fun. This is my, I'm, I'm saluting here in 1956 at age three, I guess. Probably flying an Air Force airplane. I guess that would foretell what's coming with sisters. On the right there is Sister Margaret in the back of the room. But here's Sister Margaret. I'll say, if there's a saint in my family, it's Sister Margaret. I was working at a booth yesterday for the American Aviation Historical Society. And she comes over bringing snacks and drinks and just taking care of her little brother. She is a pretty good famous course there. It's been painted by Charles Hubble, a very famous painter. I actually shot this photo. I'm a retired FedEx pilot. This was in flight operations in Federal Express, and I'm a pilot there. And then 10 years ago, Robert Odenbrock was here. Me and my wife, Lisa, and Robert Odenbrock, 10 years ago, at that intervention. And most folks in the crowd know the trash can Robert was lost in the crash for about six weeks. After the photo was shot, and uh, of course, it was destroyed. But, uh, Robert was well beloved by the Warburg community, and uh, people uh, so never be forgotten by the, by the folks here that did such a great man. Uh, Dad had three Corsairs. Uh, actually, this one's his very first, and the F 2G race plan I just showed you is number two. Uh, this is a stock FT1. That's our house. Dad had told me about the flat roof that leaked all the time. I didn't have a pitch roof, there it is, and he towed it backwards on his landing gear. By the way, a Corsair with outboard wings off is about more, more than twice as wide as two pickup trucks. So, he only was playing about 40 miles that way, just jogging vehicles and whatnot. A uh, little trivia this airplane, take airplane, uh, known as the City of Painesville, also known as a Lucky Gallon. It was a coldly loaded to a woman named Marge Herbert, and she used it in 1947 to beat Jackie Cochran's speed record of all, of all people, Jackie Cochran, to uh, beat her speed record. And Jackie's record was 292, and Marge got the course shift at 337 miles per hour. Of course, Jackie Cochran would later go, go super fine and jazz and set a whole bunch of new records. So. This is the cockpit. I'm retrieving it four years ago in Iowa. Uh, Uh, 
already mentioned that here he is in the cockpit of a B-36 of all things, a 10-inch giant. Nobody else had one outside the military, but he got one. Uh, so. And then, if Walter by his second twin Mustang, this guy's a order of four shares of twin Mustangs. He had three four shares, two twin Mustangs. And now about 1990, here's what happened. That's why we call this Christie F-86. It, the fire department had practiced with it a little bit, so the bottom of the skin was kind of muffled to break from bottom to be damaged. But it was made an airplane nobody else would want, except he did my body want it. You take an orphan airplane that nobody else wanted, well, I'll save it. That's kind of this thing. Here is with a, a pre ejection seat F 80. Is that all? one of the very, very early F 80s? Uh, he's standing by the long nose here of the color ship we're about to see talk about. The very long nose here. And here he's with, again, the F 2G Corsair 74 back in 1971. In the background, you can see the, our second B-25 and a fuselage of an A-26. There's uh, Walter, my mom, mom, Peggy, at Airshow 1954. He used to say that she was first in his life and airplanes were a close second. There were times I had trouble seeing the order of what doing that thing. Now this is a just to show a wide range of who he was, we, sometimes he hauled crash airplanes. It would be a government bid for a, a crash fire plane or something, and I can't remember which one this was. But I saw this on a blog where somebody asked, uh, was he a scrapman who liked airplanes? Or was he an airplane guy who liked junk? He did a little bit of both. Now, this is what I'm talking about. This is a 34 share. Uh, it's F FG1, made by Goodyear. And if you imagine how we built it home, I was age seven, and I got to see this thing come down the road, backwards, a dirt road by the house, on a tailwheel on a flatbed truck that you from a farmer. And there was this, you know, of course, landing is wider than the road, so long years going through the tall weeds, you know, up and down. I just stood there and just dazzled as he, right before my eyes, he pulled this thing down the road by the house. This, this airplane he got for $200. Uh, this is considered an airport eyesore. And it was a very complete course here. I dare say we're just putting a new fabric on it and checking the engine and it, it goes it was five five all down a whole lot of work. It was that good of condition when he got it. Here's mom with the same course here. We had the wings on it, this photo. And here's the now getting into the twin Mustang. There's the XP82 fuselage. We all saw the XP82 three years ago. That's the left fuselage of it. And he's using, he's reconstructed the rear of his B-36. He's a carpenter, he's got a two by four that she know. He's making a warehouse out of the rear fuselage of the B-36. And it's swallowing up the uh, XP-82 for storage. And next to them is the fuselage of the P-63 King Cobra. Here's Walter Hall, Walter this is the XP-82. It had an accident at Cleveland with uh, NACA before it was NASA. It just skipped off the cash play, whatever. Um, got some bent propeller blades, got in the mud. And this kind of tells you how a guy that so little means to collect airplanes. But a theme of this collection was almost every airplane he got, something bad happened to it. It was not going to be repaired by NASA. They just run it off and sold it at $300 in the scrap bin. Uh, and there are plenty of surplus airplanes. And it damaged an airplane in 1950. Just go get another one. Uh, they, they didn't repair stuff that got banged up like that. Uh, this is the 846 he got. Oh, he got the moment in Mixfield in Chicago and ended up in Lake Michigan. Uh, I had a joke that they don't want to pilot, but we talked about sink rate on flying lean pattern. So monitor your sink rate. Well, landing in the water definitely adds to the phrase sink rate. Uh, but again, it was the damaged aircraft, that's how he got it. Tom Rowley, a lot of folks know here, he's told both the A26 and the P51. He tells me that at 5,000 feet, an A26 is faster than a stock P51. That's what they became executive transports as this one was. 
when it crashed. There's a picture of the Yanmar A26 before the accident, same, same tail number. And then back to this idea of, of damaged aircraft, of course, Air said before it blew its engine in 1949. And there were no surplus R4360. They were building B36s and C124 low pastures, that kind of stuff was coming. So if you wanted to replace the engine, you had to go to Pratt Whitney and buy a brand new one. Nobody had the wallet for that, so it was it was done, fine. And that got the sports there for $500. Uh, there's a KC-97 tanker. The story was it was overstressed by the pilots deciding to do aerobatics for the KC-97 tanker. So it was junk and detonated another warehouse. This is fast forward to 1971. Uh, he felt that the zoning board would probably not give him a permit to build the building, so I'll just haul a big airplane home and use it as a storage building. Uh, he could not get off his carpenter job that summer, they were just way too busy. So at age 18, I hauled this thing mostly myself. I mean, it's crazy, but uh, that's me by the, that's me by the, by the 97 right there. Thank you, Dad. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Wild Cargo, again, Carl's airplane did landing gear up in Cincinnati in 1963. Uh, so it up. Something bad happened to it. It's available for a very low cost. Dad paid $500 for that airplane. Back to the F 82. Again, it's going to fly again. Like, well, this same XP 82 on the cover of Sport Aviation four years ago. Same airplane. On the cover of Air Classics. Airspace, play tags, and I've seen a cover wild cargo B25 with Jerry Higgins' uh, uh, program for me, uh, air show they had there. That's um, Corsica 74 on the cover. Uh, Corsica 57, this was not our plane, but I bring it up for two reasons. People have almost cussed me out when I say, Outboard wings on forest airs have fabric. They go, oh, that's a bunch of BS to think those 400 miles an hour. Well, you see all the rock fabric on the wings. This uh, airplane was only 10 miles from our location. It was not our airplane. It was another one of the F2G racing airplanes. And while we're over there, we stored that airplane. Uh, and not without the help of my father, by the time that plane became a basket case, and I just got the basket case status got worse and worse and worse. And folks said it was not restorable. Things like the motor mount was missing, the can't be just one of the kind of airplane. A lot of stuff was missing. So my father loaned Robert some parts of the blue course there, as well as let Robert take, take the collings and stuff off, look at the exhaust system, those kind of things. So Robert spent a lot of time looking at the course there 74 to restore the course there 57. To give my father credit for that. Here's Dad in his own airplane article of Sport Aviation 1971. Uh, I was a high school senior when I knew who Paul Holbrook was. They heard about our property on a Sunday, and uh, with him was a man I did not know, but the author of the article is Ray Shoulder of Camp Shoulder. It was almost in the term. I was standing in the presence of Ray Shoulder, didn't know who he was 50 some years ago. I'm going to sing a song here. I made a song, you know, Rolling Stone song, when I see my picture on the cover a lot. I'm going to sing that. I made some lyrics more about it. I want to see the XP on the cover, but we won't go there. If I want to listen, if somebody wants to. Don't take it. Okay, I'll take it. Here's his second twin Mustang. It's an F 82E. That's all of us kids trying to fix the spar structure. Uh, on the lower guy on the left, I can see, I can't see, it's better. This is uh, Barbara, Rita, and Margaret. If you're Margaret, it's on the far side of the right. So, you know, we grew up with these things. Another shot of the F 82E. It's a very large airplane. Uh, Dad would get questions, the phone calls. Folks saying, I want to buy your Mustang. Because I don't have a Mustang. Oh, yeah, you've got two of them. Turning on the photo angle, they thought they saw two Mustangs. And Dad's like, well, no, uh, it's the same airplane. You won't get to sell it anyways. Carl knows about that. He wouldn't sell stuff for a while. Another shot of the F 82, kind of looking down on some other aircraft. We've got the, uh, the, the P-80 jet, there's kind of getting here. P-80 jet there, wild car, the B-25, Nathan's house, there's something, you know, that's another reason we're working. There's a couple of things we've been talking about. 
And on the second E25, I'll kind of back kind of together there. Okay, Wally World. This is not a Chevy Chase vacation movie. I promise you that. Uh, 1961, I get involved in all the airplanes at age eight. Dad and I call this bamboo bomber home. You can see there's a whole lot of airplane on not enough trailer. And that theme is going to just keep on and on and on. Uh, my job is mostly taking the screws out from the wing tail fairies and little stuff like that. Again, we had no crane or forklift. It's a long story how we got to sit on board, we got on board, we got home. Uh, and just a clunker 52 Ford, and then it's, I mean, pump, we got all pump. It's, it's similar to a lot of The school bus in the back is going to have a very interesting picture, very soon. Okay, during my years, this is mostly a complete list. I want the good stuff that we get out all together the, the Bobcat. T28, uh, two B25s, Lockheed Shooting Star P80, SNJ Texan, the Onmark uh, A26, TVM Avenger, two of those, BT12 Software, O52 Owl, uh, Douglas Skyraider, two of those, and the MP40, a whole bunch of engines and other stuff out of school folks put over here. He kept me pretty busy. Uh, okay, this is the. Now, he thought I was. Uh, Going over the top about that, thinking outside of the box. Here we go. Uh, the F 70 Cutlass, we saw it on the air show in, in, in uh, 57 or so. Uh, I'm asking for any airplane experts, what airplane is kind of hiding behind the Cutlass? Little airplane test here. That's good. That's a lot. Uh, I just happen to know that. Good. We are an outside. We love so here's your dad talking to us in Navy guys. Now, when you, I went to military disposal yards with my father many, many, many times, and you'd only work with the civil service people. Well, they called in the brass. And they got this really unusual guy, I'm not some really unusual. So there's your dad talking to uniformed Navy people, which is not the normal thing at the disposal yard. He's explaining he's got to put this cutlass in that school bus. And there he is, but he gets the approval to do that. Did I mention Walter thinking outside the box? There's a crane holding up the fuselage, and part of the story Dad tells you you can't see in the photo. He had to cut the roof with a torch. It just wasn't big enough, and they actually they got stuck trying to get in there. They put a bulldozer behind the fuselage, and Dad's went on the brakes, the wheels chalk, and they just pushed the over bulldozer. And he told the story that there was screeching and popping and loud noises and the bulldozer. And also it occurred to him, if this thing cocked sideways while it's coming forward, it could crush the hypocrisy. You know, nobody would hear it until it's too late. And he got the, the radar nose right up against the dashboard. Uh, it's just crazy. He did it. You know? And I thought this, this is, I thought this photo of Walter the Conqueror. He got on top, it's all loaded. He's got a little trailer behind it, and, and the Navy guys find up there placing bets on whether he'll make it or not. And so he has to crash. He says, "Well, well, how many people think I'm going to make it?" And the answer is nobody thinks he's going to make it. The highest bet on base is 50 miles. He's got 600 miles to go. And there, of course, you know, when you go down the highway, you've got to have your license plate. So he scores off the back of his bus, license tag, and stuck it in with the action burner to go for the jet. That's the most aft thing on this load. He's got to fly off. And then, you know, here's that uh, And we'll get to this reconstruction photo. So he finally, he's been gone a week, which is really, that was never gone that long. He finally comes home at like 7 in the morning, just driving all night. And mom won't let me right out of the house and he's done with the vehicle, that's his car. So as soon as he's parked, I run down the stairs. I'm 8 going on 9. That's a standard school bus, so the doors go. I look in the doors, I just see aluminum. Where's my father? Now, it's a scuffing noise. A spread eagle on top of the fuselage, there's about that much space in the, the top of the fuselage in the roof. So he would spread eagle himself in the driver's seat over the fuselage, come out. He gets beat first and finally come down the door. 
are the dorms. And I was like, it's just crazy that he had to do that every time he stopped for food or for gas or or uh, in many cases got pulled over by the highway patrol. <laughs> and that little more detail in the book uh, about the highway patrol, uh, he made the really bad mistake of getting on the New York State Thruway. That's, that's about a couple of pages in the book about that. But, uh, they were going to build a book. They were actually going to, what she wanted to do with them, find the only reason to let them go was that, said, uh, if, if you don't take this thing out of here, we don't know what the hell to do with it. Uh, another story he told was a cop pulled him over at night and walked around looking the thing over. He said, I'm not going to give you a citation. I'm not even going to call him the station. And they said, well, why not? He goes, don't think I'm dreaming again. So, so the cop let go. So here we are. He just got this suburban. It's going to be the workhorse vehicle. He made this homemade trailer just for this trip. It's like a chassis from a FedEx or UPS van uh, back in that day. And hauled the right wing on that trailer. With the wing folded up, just as in the photo, uh, it's an 80 place on a wing fold. And his boot tractor was broke, so there was no way to reassemble it. This is where I got in the action to mom stop me. I started, he had me show how to jack his hydraulic jacks and jack up the axle, get it higher and higher and block it, you know, add blocks, move the jack, add more blocks. I got the wheels about a foot off the ground when mom fought me and told him, it's free to me to get out of there. And I surprised my mother. mother wasn't going to yell at me, but she was yelling at me. And I soon realized I wasn't the one in trouble. Uh, and she called it off and took my father down and said, uh, you're not going to kill the, kill the children doing this. Kill yourself, okay, but don't kill the kids. I was tired by then, so I'm glad that I got to finish the job. And we got the wing high enough, but we had to kind of use a bomb waist to pull the fingers together, the wing mounts, and got that done somehow. If you look closely, this one was also in the book, you can see the Navy insignia through the windows of the bus right there. <laughs> I mean, it's this great guy. Yeah. This is our house, and side, you want to defer you a little bit. This is, does Cutlass jet, I just showed you, would be over here out of the photo. That's the idea of what we're talking about. Uh, this is a shop. We live upstairs. This is the later photo, the late 60s, the SNJ. The Cutlass is on this area right now. It's on perspective. Uh, this is a photo that gives me chills in terms of danger. Uh, he took the main landing gear off the right wing to haul it home. He learned to leave the left gear installed when he got the left wing because being a Navy jet, they're already pounds of carrier. That, that landing gear is very thick and heavy. Uh, I flew deeper against the Air Force later, and the Navy guys joked about our skinny landing gear. They all had thick, heavy landing gear. So, this whole thing supported with a post right here, the cement block, and jack there. If anything lets go, this whole thing's coming down. I mean, it had. So, he's grunting and getting the landing gear up here. And my job was to turn the bolts in, you know, to start to get the bolts started. I'm about eight going on nine. And uh, between two of us, we got that name here on. But until it was installed, there was a lot of danger there that they coming down. Because yeah. the issue is, we've got, we're getting the trailer out. We can't get the landing gear installed because the trailer's in the way. So we got to get the trailer out with the gear in. The trailer is what's holding the weight up. So it's, uh, it's a very dangerous, precarious moment. Get a little further along here, the landing gear is down. That's uh, me over there hanging for a panel on the front of the airplane. And then the later shot, there's me and, and my sister Barbara, she's not here. I'm hanging on the right there, and then Barbara is right there. I have to clarify to get the idea. Uh, the last of the jet is on the back of the school bus, and we're starting to jack it real high to get that long nose gear extended. A sister Barbara asked this, and Margaret was here this too. Margaret would concur. Barbara was a great mechanic. Uh, and we, she worked a lot on both B-25s. I, I went alone on most trips, but the B-25s, there was so, so much disassembly and so many bolts and cables. And so Barbara and I worked hand on hand, you know, doing the small bolts and cables together, holding the your doors together. And dad worked on something, something else. So, uh, Barbara knew she had a 12 point deep, deep 17, 16 socket. She knew exactly what she wanted, and so she was a great uh, mechanic for a young lady. Became a nun of the common later. Well, figured, 
There's me and mom, but I thought this was all back together. I got that cockpit one. I played in all the cockpits, of course, as a boy. So I get up in this tall cockpit on a summer day, and you could walk up the back of the airplane, slide a canopy back, and that covered it with sheet metal. So I, I get in there, I slide a canopy and close it, and there's a giant loss in there, right over my head. So I, I kind of started sliding the canopy back, put the loss closer. I had the canopy about halfway open, and all the loss just swarmed. So I, there's foot pegs on the other side of the cockpit. I really go head first, grab the foot pegs, wait until my feet were down, just going down, and then jump. And that thing is about two and a half, almost three stories high. But, uh, and like I said, that was my first egress of a jet plane for a boy who would become a pilot. If the jet is either an operation, I probably would use it. Well, I'll scare that out of you. So, <laughs> moving on from there, it's 1964, we get into the B 25, wild cargo. Uh, as me on the scan pass, I'm the top the cockpit, and this is Bernie. So we got the left wing off, I'm up there pulling bolts out on the right wing. The dad's shadow, you're taking the photo of us taking the B 25 apart. Again, we need gravity to be our friend, not be our enemy. Dad the carpenter built these wood frames designed to fold over, and we use the winds to let the, as the wind drifted from the airplane once the bolts are out. We just things collapsed in a controlled manner to lower the wings of the trailer. Uh, that was a genius at doing stuff like this without having to look the real equipment you needed. That's me by the, the two engines. We almost did not make it up the hill with those two motors in the back of the trailer with that six cylinder Chevy. Uh, by nightmares of the phone backwards down that hill had we not made it, but we did. This is a good shot. This is taken for a newspaper article locally in Cincinnati. And so uh, I don't have rights to this. I put it in my book. And for there's Dad, there's Margaret, back in the room. That's me, and, and there's Barbara, and uh, down in Cincinnati with Wild Cargo. The same trailer, this workhorse trailer that started his life with the Cutlass. Uh, we call many, many air cuts on between two B-25s. Then we got the cockpit section coming off, split from the center wing. It's all, the suburban's going to tow all that home. There's a massive, you can't see the, the screen, there's a massive number of cables, trim tab cables, control cables, all the dangling line. There's a center wing at home. Uh, again, too much load, not not the trailer, a lot of airplane, not much trailer, but it got the job done we got on. They're all back together. Uh, over here is the tail of a P-47 Thunderbolt. This engine, you can't see it here, that got a bunch of, it's a little shady, but it's a, it's a hex, well, I, I have a better photo cover, we'll get to that. Again, a bolt cover. And Here's a shot of this Carl Schultz right here in the front row. Uh, is standing. That's, this is, oh, I got the magazine article. Uh, this, uh, that's Carl right here in the room. And they're getting ready to fly up. Yeah. How, how long was that grass strip? Uh, 2,300 feet. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, didn't come back and land there. But, uh, uh, trees at one end and uh, uh, a water filtration plant and a condominium at the other end. That was the downhill side, but we went the uphill side and went through the trees. Oh, uh, I just can't imagine. So, and that's something else. Uh, again, this, this story is about people. And I was watching this uh, movie, The Imitation Game, with Benedict Cumberbatch plays uh, Alan Turing, where they're working on a machine to break the German code in World War II. And, and and there's a saying in the movie, sometimes it's the people who no one imagines anything of who do things no one can imagine. So I, I think that fits my father. Let's go through some slides. I, I, this, I mean, this is a slide I talked about earlier. This story should not have happened. This guy's not educated, he's got no money, he stutters, uh, comes from a broken home, but he gets to start somehow. We had a SN Jamie Hall, we didn't have a you know, pickup truck, so I put the tail. The doors off the suburban and just put the tail on the other side of the family car. Why not? Uh, on this trip, I had to sit backwards when we turned the corner, meaning get the, the beam of the suburban to dent the fuse box. I tell him, you turn a little more, turn a little more, like Scotty, go 
That's all you got, Captain. Can't keep any more. You know, pretty much turning sharper than that. Sometimes I have to drive off, off the road and even the grass to make the turn without that in the SNJ. But that's how we did things. Uh, here's the AC 97 again, same trailer, newer suburban. Uh, we, in one day, me and Dad, with a few, with a few chips he was with me, we just they took the whole top of this airplane off with, with hatchets, axes, hacksaws. There were some bolts that we had around the round sections, but as far as the nose and tail, we chopped all that into the small section, trailer home to make the storage bolt. And you can see here, not at home, you see the past sheet metal where it's being reassembled back home to make the storage building. Again, you see Walter McConnell earlier. There you saw that earlier. And this is a new shot you haven't seen. We got an entire wing of a pinky shooting star on the trailer. It won't fit, of course. The wing is so long, it has to go over the roof of the spur. So we got a pallet here. It's got to elevate this wing so it fits over the rear of the car. Family car, money, the family car. Uh, and here in the D36 car, we have seen this shot. And so I go back to this thing. Uh, this is actually what Alan Turing said. The, uh, 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 we're considered uh, very, one of the best mathematicians of his time. Today we talk about algorithms a lot. This is the guy that thought of all that stuff. Um, but sometimes it's the people no one imagines anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. I really think that's my father. This P47 fuselage, we got from kind of Girl Rider in Chicago, get the suburban bolt at home. There's Dad, I cropped him out earlier. This is Earl Iron, another Warburg guy, kind of like my father, didn't have much money, but he got Warburgs, and they were affordable. Uh, they became very effective friends until Earl passed away in 92. Uh, I'm going to have a little fun here. Uh, Bernie, uh, uh, Weezy Bernie, you know, Tom, uh, helper with the SP, she gave me this photo. This is Tom Riley working on a B25. Wow, I'm going to let you know here. If you go out here today in the forward line, those planes are polished to perfection. I mean, you can eat off those airplanes. They're so clean. It was not uncommon in the 60s, 70s, even the early 80s to make an air with B25 that has been sitting for seven or eight years and carry it somewhere. And uh, 20 years. What? Yeah, no, 20 years, yes, yeah, it's 20 years. And so, this is a pretty shabby looking B 25. Tom's getting ready to go. Uh, not to make any trophy that I find the shabby B 25. So, Earl was asked a question there is a ferry B 25, and the question was, what kind of equipment should we bring to ferry this ferry with B 25? And my answer was, just two coffins. That's all you're going to need is two coffins to ferry that airplane. Uh, so, it was kind of dangerous what those guys were doing. Well, going to Earl Weiner's place, I read a book called Aerospace Pilot with the Air Force Union Hotchet Trainer with T 38. And I dreamed of flying that airplane. This issue came up again about half a load of college being officer. Uh, it just didn't seem in anywhere in my future. That's what I decided at age 12 I wanted to do. Uh, back to the property here. This is an 052 Owl, a rear officer race plane, T 28 A. And uh, C2 over there. And in conjunction with that plane, we got a, a rare BT12, stainless steel BT12. I don't know if there's any more than just the one. Both of those airplanes came from an AMP school in Columbus, Ohio, the FA Citadel School. Those planes are not representative of what we wanted the students to learn on, like 7172, so they got it going for a couple hundred bucks and two more really rare airplanes. This fire shed is a very nice International Guard F 86L. This is me. We're taking a TV on the part. I'm over talking on the lane here, getting retracted for the center wing to come out. Just about to finish high school. And I get, I started this photo earlier about the, uh, I'm going to pick on the suburban here. I call it the, uh, the highway of humiliation. Uh, this vehicle, you can see how shabby it looks. Uh, it's, uh, I'm a little worried in the photo. The airplanes have stall bucket and mock bucket. The suburban had its own bucket. We almost never had two of the same tires on the vehicle. All four tires are only different. He would never pick it a real balance. You know, the front end was wore out. So the same with this shape. Here's the toolbox, the tool grab, the toolbox, stuff like that going on the highway. Uh, 
And Dad started to say, when he said it the first time, you know, I'm on to something. This is the 60s and 70s, and I'm going to space, and it was dead playing the steering wheel, and Dad said, you almost have to be an astronaut to try the Suburban. And once he said it one time too many, and Mom said, no, the astronauts would be too afraid. <laughs> oh, the, the, the hood's up on the Suburban, because the motor overheats every time we go up the mountain, we call the F-80 there. There it is, home. We got the uh, F-80 wing coming off trailer, wild cargo, Corsair 74, 228. There's a P-80, all that together. Under the wing of, wing of our second B-25 in view there. And again, it's more, uh, this photo here, that collected all kinds of stuff on government bids. One bid just happened to include the outboard wings for an 85 star wing. Who wants a star in the wings? I don't know. Uh, the junk suburban, now yeah, we've got spare parts folks, so if you're a junk vehicle, spare parts, the whole, whole package here. Well, that gets the prototype Skyrim, XBD2D, and it's got no outboard wings. So we're going to wall with it, with the late model 85 wings, it's the prototype, yeah, they do. Yeah. So he ends up with a complete Skyrim, just happens to have a spare set of wings when he gets the Skyrim. And now we have a little fun here. What does it mean for a supply airplane for this thing we've lost to do? It doesn't mean this. The better B25 engine. It doesn't mean this. It place got pretty cluttered in later years. Um, what it means is we're trying to find a big engine that's just it's, there's it's buried under a bunch of stuff. So uh, I spent a year and a half with a, a German Juno 212 uh, inverted B12 engine with radiator on the front. Now, I spent a year and a half trying to find that engine. It's <laughs> buried under my colleague, Mr. Mello, finally found it. And Jerry Aiken has it now, by the way. Uh, now, I, I, I said I knew back this in. Uh, it's an X24 Allison from 1916. It's in the Museum in Connecticut right now. I read the data place myself and said, the Allison Engine Company manufactures number one. The Air Force Museum, right back, not the bad mouth of the Air Force Museum, they, they scrapped about a dozen very, very rare engines and scrapped by the Gotland Motors, called my dad, said, he knew his engine, said, I got some really rare engines, I don't, I'm not about to scrap them, they're too historic. Can you save them for me? And Walt did so. There's a firewall fork on the uh, SB, uh, SB2C held out. I hold that on for my dad, $50, uh, done it there. Uh, Visitors often ask, what's he going to do with all this? Uh, I have the same question. Watch him catch 22 movies. We watched that movie together when it came out, kind of gave me some hint of uh, issues that would, 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 would affect that. He, he was a, a good friend of Ed Maloney, who started the Hunter Museum in California, and uh, kind of wanted to be like Ed Maloney, but that was a one man band. He, he was, wasn't. He could, wasn't able to lead the people that would take to do fundraising, find an airport, find a building, and, and get this thing going. He was just, uh, he, he was going to do it himself, uh, all by himself, and he wasn't going to delegate those, uh, that authority to anybody else to, to manage a museum. Or, so it was, this wasn't going to happen. Uh, and that, that included me. Uh, I, I could see I didn't have much future there, and I wanted to be a professional pilot. So I, uh, that's, and how we went our separate ways. So I finally got some money about 50 years ago. I sold a 715 a Mama Champ. Uh, I had to get my private license almost 50 years ago. I put Mom and Dad flying in a rented uh, private Cherokee. And that leads to the aerial shot about 1973 of all the airplanes. It's getting a little cluttered out here, and that's the B 36 stuff. Uh, I was away at the airport. Uh, basic, doing basic training in Texas. Well, I was in the Air Force twice, listed guys, radio tech, and then later off, shooting a pilot. And I came home on leave for Christmas of 72, and I not know better, I thought two 747s collided on my dad's property. But he had all the chunky pieces of B 36 were there, and it really did change the nature of things. Uh, but he, he it's an orphan, but nobody wanted so he got the B 36. Here it is, kind of reconstructed. Uh, most of this down here is not original. This is Carpenter Walter, 2x4 machine. The cockpit up here is pretty much intact, but 
he, but, he, but the NTSB will put together a crashed airline. He did much the same thing with the, with the B-36. But next to that is an F-101 Voodoo that made a smoking hole in Ohio and killed both crew members. And we call that, in the same time we were all wild cargo home in 1964, I was a little voice, I couldn't do Teddy stuff. There was an abundance of small pieces to be loaded on the Voodoo crash. And I'm going through the records of this thing where I finally found a piece of a flight from down in an oxygen mask. It was pretty grisly for his young boy. And thinking, well, I still wanted to fly. So eventually I made it to Air Force pilot training with the white helmet on my head. And I was very motivated to keep that thing in one piece, you can imagine. Uh, there are the T-37 out of Mississippi, close Air Force Base. Here I'm flying the T-38 as a student, flying a solo formation flight. This is a good shot here. We're flying a four-ship uh, laser jig and fingertip, and just to go talk airplanes for a second. We don't just fly a straight level with a four-shot. I like a talking to figure eight. So you got four airplanes. In military laser jigs, they're flown to 90 degrees of bank. Up here with the top of the lazy eight, with four aircraft in 90 degrees of bank in close formation. We're going to swoop on down, pick up about four. Our four and knots and more start pulling three Gs and just welcome to go the way around. Uh, all four airplanes in tight formation. That's me flying solo on my first four ship T38 ride. Right? And again, flying solo on four ship, that's, that's me and that airplane. And I made this photo, I combined two photos. At the same time I was learning to fly the T38, Dad was calling a, a, a DC-7 home. And so we definitely went different paths at this point in our lives. Had a little fun with this. Uh, Big Wally was a popular spray cleaner in the 1970s. I think I don't know how that way. Big Wally was a spray guy. So that's a fun thing to do. And here's a uh, hey, bye bye. The hero shop we called it when he sold on the jet in the T38. And we were, my fiance, today my wife, leaves the graduation night, did my wings in the Air Force pilot training. I, I like flying a T-38 so much, I volunteered to teach this. I was a T-38 instructor, flew for about almost five years. Uh, and I'm a flight commander here. This, this is an interesting photo, that's me at the front. It's Wade Carver Day, welcome to a bunch of guests here. Off to the right, you can't see him, it's H. Ross Perot. Ross Perot Jr. was one of our students in our class. I was a flight commander. That was a lot of fun to get to know that guy. And then uh, 141, but I was done with the Air Force. I fought this flying Airbus first officer at FedEx. Bill Sturman flying on a FedEx trip with a buddy who wanted me to teach him aerobatics and the Sturman called I could do that. And Airbus captain at FedEx, they're a pretty flight. Airbus 757 captain. Uh, this, now back to B 25s this is kind of a big photo. Dad was a full time carpenter, so. Holidays were work days at the Sublotter Ranch. Uh, this is Thanksgiving Day of 1966. We also hung the loads on Wild Cargo. I did some work on it on Thanksgiving Day. We were to have a half work day on Thanksgiving, and then we have dinner and all that. But this is a great shot of, for the second B-25, Dad decided we would not remove the propellers. All the engine and prop is one unit. But fortunately, we don't one motor at a time. We pulled about 80 miles from Pennsylvania before we got the second B-25. And so we're trying to load, put the motor on, but the boom tractor the front end goes up in the air because there's not enough weight to balance the engine and prop. So all the kids are on cement blocks and steel wheels. We're all up on the boom there, which we started to debate to my sisters who weighed the most. Dad and I had no part of that conversation. Uh, so once they're balancing the, the motor to, to get it on the B25, and oh, the, the hood's up on the suburban. Because there's only one battery that the supply of the state right now being borrowed from the boom track. And 50, 50 years later, 50 years later to the day, that's me by the white engine of the 767. I was flying on Thanksgiving today in 2016. I'm tired of this month from, from, from being here on top. Last airplane, uh, Dad hauled a Neptune P2V. Uh, you can see this photo. This is his airplane. It's got snow skis on it. We knew something was weird about it. And I had an article in Air and Space magazine in 2007, and a guy called me, flew on sister ship 437. He said, by the way, you probably don't know this, but they configured a number of Neptunes to go to Antarctica. They had Jato bottles, they had snow skis, 
He said, if you're Neptune, yes, Neptune is the last survivor of those Neptunes that went to Antarctica. Okay, so is there a plan so there's a Corsair that Marge Hurlburt beat Jackie Cochran's record with? The, the, the Corsair 74, where you think the air races? All those airplanes seem to stumble upon some kind of unusual history. Uh, but this is really weird. So the guy called me in the morning about this history of 436. That's a pretty great story. And then that night, I'm on standby at FedEx. I get called to fly Airbus 436. <laughs> and I'm like, man, if, if George Kennedy or uh, you know, one of those guys showed up in the jump seat, we're already sick. It's like Twilight Zone stuff. And I get the same tail number that night to fly. I couldn't believe it. And it's Airbus 8 through 10 300. And here it is. I got this photo on eBay for like $11. On the back, it's just a stamp saying, this is that airplane. It's uh, taking off in Antarctica. You can see the ring of fire in the Jato files. It's departing in Antarctica in like February 1960, going over to uh, New Zealand. And uh, I call them sick. We're part of my airplanes on fire like that. This is a great photo, and that's that's it. That's that one. Last slide. I've also got a podcast out. You can just Google B45 in the background. And I got about 20 minutes to yak it up. It's the same kind of stuff here. So, anyway, that completes the presentation. Uh,